of it, and then they just forget, and they're like off doing something totally different. I don't know if you can uh, relate with that, but my daughter, for example, I was downstairs, and my wife was upstairs, and she said, honey, and I said, yeah, and she said, tell Vi to bring up the baby wipes, you know, because we have babies, and so we need the, the wipes to, when we're changing, and so I said, Vi, and she said, yeah, I said, take up the baby wipes to mom, and she said, okay, so I sat down, I started reading my Bible, and then my wife said, honey, I said, Yes! And she said, where's my wipes? And I said, oh. and I looked, and I see on the couch, the wipes are still there. Then I looked around, and I looked, and the side of my eye, I seen outside of my yard, my daughter doing backflips. <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, what? What you doing? And she said, backflips. <laughs> and I said, I told you to take the wipes out to mom. She said, oh, I forgot. And so she runs in, she takes the wipes, she takes it upstairs. And I'm like, why do I have to tell you so many times? It would be so great if I could just tell you one time and you would just do it. And it happens all the time. My son, the other day, I told him to wash the cars. We have two cars. And so I said, boy, go outside and wash the cars. So I said, okay. So I'm, in, I'm inside. I'm, I'm again, I, I'm reading my, my, my Bible and I'm studying. And I hear the water just running. Just running outside. And so I'm studying, studying, studying. I just hear the water outside. And I walk outside the door and I look to my left to see my son on his phone like this. <laughs> and I said, boy. He said, huh? What you doing? <laughs> oh, texting my friend? I said, texting your friend? I told you to wash the car. I said, oh yeah, I just, I just started texting. I said, you see all the water on the concrete? <laughs> that means that you didn't just start texting. You've been doing it a lot. And so the water is just pouring on the ground, you know? And he's like, oh, 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 sorry. I said, wash the cars. And so he, he finally does it. So many of us are like that though, you know? And, and, and you know, we're told to do something or we tell somebody, hey, this is what I want you to do and they do some of it, or we're lucky sometimes if they even do it at all. And we're gonna get into this story. We're at the last, we're at the end of, um, of uh, the, the lessons from Elijah, so, so after today we'll, we'll move on to a, another lesson. But um, let's start off in, in 1 Kings 19, and uh, for, so most of you have kind of gone through some of this and you kind of have an idea of what, we're, what we've been talking about. We've been pulling out all these life lessons from the life of Elijah, and he's just been teaching us so, so much. And here's another lesson that he teaches us. And so it, it's found in 1 Kings 19, and we're going to um, pick it up at verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, by the way, God is speaking to Elijah in an audible voice. Okay, so right before this, God did that whole thing in the cave with the wind and, and the rocks. We were just, we were all we were just um, inside of the cave and, and the fire. And God was not found in the fire. He was not found in the world, but he was found in the small whisper, in the small voice. That's where God was found. So now God is talking to Elijah. This is what he says. Then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of um, Nimshi, as king over, over Israel. So he's over um, Syria, and Nimshi as king over Israel. And Elisha, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, um, Behola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Um, let me see where I'm at. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of um, Hazael, um, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth um, that has not kissed him. Okay, so here we have Elijah. And this is during Elijah's downfall. He's just gone through this whole big thing about depression. Um, He's done all these wonderful miracles. And all of a sudden, this lady with a note, with this little message says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And he just falls apart into a million pieces. And he gets scared, and he runs for his life. There's this whole big revival that's taking place in Israel, and Elijah's not there. He ran away because of this threat that the queen Jezebel gave to him. And so here, here's Elijah. Now he's receiving a message from the Lord. So the Lord tells him to anoint um. Uh, Hazael, king over Syria, and anoint Jehu, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha to be the prophet and take his place. Okay, so that's the that's the that's what God wants him to do. That's the instructions. That's how we give instructions to our children. We say, hey, this is what I want you to do. One, two, three, do those things. But let's take a look at what Elijah does. So he departed from there 
and found Elisha, the son of Shadad, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. And so here we, here we see it. God says, okay, I want you to, to anoint this, this king, and I want you to anoint this king, and I want you to anoint Elisha. And so with the audible voice that he hears God speak to him, he goes out, and of the three things that God tells him to do, he does one of them. He does the last thing, and he finds his own replacement. And it's a time like that, that just like parents, God would say to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing? What are you doing? I told you to do all these things. And Elijah just goes, and he, and he, um, and he, and he anoints um, Elisha. So Elisha is going to be Elijah's predecessor. He's going to be the, the mentee. He's going he's gonna to follow Elijah. So the names are Elijah and Elisha. Okay? So now Elijah goes and he finds Elisha. And already we see, you know, the lesson in that is that it shows up God's mercy towards Elijah. And God shows this mercy to us as well. Because just like kids, God tells us to do all kinds of stuff. And sometimes we do it, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we rate just like he does too. And here he does one out of three things. One out of three. And sometimes God tells us to do things. He says, you know, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. And we're like, ah, oh, you know what, I don't feel like doing that. And uh, what we do, what we have a tendency to do, is we have a tendency to agree with God, but we don't always obey God. You see, to agree with God is to do what God says to do, and we want to do it. Hey, I want you to go to a men's group. Great. I love going to men's group because we've got all the boys over there. We see music. There's lots of food. There's no, you know, there's no children to run after and chase around. And there's no wife to tell you to hurry up. Let's go home. It's just, it's a great time. I just, yeah, let's go. Let's go to the men's group. And so, so we go, we go and we, we do that. And we just, we're, we're agreeing with God. But when the Lord says, hey, I want you to go over there and speak to that person. That person needs a touch from me. And I need you to go and talk to that person. And then it's a matter of agreeing or obeying. Because sometimes it's like, oh, but God, I don't want to go because I'm going to feel weird. And I look so dumb. I don't want to talk about stuff. And I don't even know who that person is. And God says, that's what I want you to do. And sometimes we do it. And sometimes we don't. You see, it's good to, it's easy to agree with God when he goes along the lines of what we want to do. But it's hard sometimes to obey God, to do things that he tells us to do that sometimes we don't feel like doing. And here we have Elijah pulling one of those, pulling one of these things. But again, you know what this, what this highlights is the mercy of God. And mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. He just, he, he, he doesn't give what we deserve, all that we deserve, judgment, we deserve punishment and discipline. And God says, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop all of that on you. And that's a, that's a sign of, of mercy that the Lord has over every single one of us. So we're going to move on. And, um, and so that, that, that's the lesson there that we learned from Elijah, a, a lesson about God and the mercy that God has for us. Because again, Elijah had broken so many things already. He had done so well, excellent, excellent. Miracles after miracles and all these wonderful things. One note from the, from the enemy and all of a sudden he falls apart. He goes into depression. He leaves the call that God called him to. He was supposed to lead this revival. All these hearts turned back to God and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And now they don't have a leader because Elijah is in the cave. And God shows him mercy. God shows him mercy, and God shows each and every one of us mercy as well. And so now let's take a look at what, what happens when he speaks with Elisha. Then Elijah passed, um, passed by him and threw his mantle on him, on Elisha. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. So what happens here is Elijah finds Elisha, and they're working in the field. There's all these oxen, and so they're plowing the, the fields. And so Elijah takes his mantle, and he puts it over Elisha. That's a symbol that says that I want you to follow me, and together we're going to do ministry. And so Elisha gets that. So he has this mantle on, and he says to Elijah, let me say goodbye to my mom and my dad, and then I'm going to come and follow you. And then Elijah, and then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what I what, what have I to do? Um, what have I done to you? So Elijah says, whatever, go. You can go, go tell your go tell your mom and dad bye. And uh, so at this point, Elijah still has this kind of like a little a little attitude. He's still kind of 
you know, he's not completely sold out, but he heard the audible voice from God. He heard from God, and he still, his heart is still kind of, is still not quite right, okay? And so, these, and so what happens is, um, so Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. This is a wonderful picture of this kind of commitment that Elisha had. Elijah comes over and says, hey, Elisha, I want you to come and follow me. And Elisha says, oh, let me go say um, bye to my parents. And Elijah has this little attitude thing. And so what Elisha does is he burns his, the, the, um, the, the yoke for the oxen. And what that means, what, what this is representing is that Elisha is burning everything that, that he could fall back on. When he gets this call to follow God, he's following God with everything that he has. He, there's, there is no plan B. He, he, killed the, he killed the oxen, and with the, with the yoke, with the, with the wood that, 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 that pulls the plow, he used that to cook, to cook the ox, oxen and feed everybody. And so what, the, what this symbolizes is that he has now burnt any bridge to any kind of life or any kind of substance, any kind of provision that he could have gotten any other way. And he says, I'm just going to trust in this ministry. I'm just going to trust in you, Lord. I'm just going to follow you with all my heart. And this is a wonderful lesson, too, that we learn from Elisha. And that is when God calls us, that sometimes our hearts are in two different places. We want to follow God because we want to agree with Him once in a while. But in order to obey Him, we have to, we have to make a, a cut. We have to make this, this clean cut and just say, you know what? There is no plan B for me. There's only one plan. I'm just going to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding and in all my ways acknowledge Him and trust that He will direct my path. But so many of us, we, we do this, like, oh, yeah, I'll follow God, but I just want to have this in my back pocket just in case. And, you know, a lot of times it, it happens with um, young adults. They'll have, uh, they'll, they'll be, they're, they're, there will be couples, and I speak out of experience, and I'm not proud of this, obviously. But there's a sense of, like, yeah, I know I should marry you, and I know we got kids, but you know what? I don't know, yeah, let me just kind of see what kind of options are, you know, and, and it's just, it's absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And uh, that's kind of sometimes, that, that's the mindset. And it's an evil mindset. Let me just say that out, out loud. It's an evil mindset. If you're going to make up your mind, you're going to follow to do something right, then do it right. And so that's why now when I, when I minister to, to young adults, I've worked with a lot of young guys, and um, they're, they're entertainers, so they have nice body, and they're good-looking guys. And they're in the same predicament where I used to be so many years ago, to, to be living together, to have children. But my mind sometimes is kind of like, I'm, I'm maybe I might have option B or C or something like that. And it's absolutely wrong. In fact, it's actually demonic. It's just, it's absolutely wrong. And so when I speak to the guys now, I say, hey, you know what? You should make up your mind already and just do the right thing. Just get married. You guys have children already. You can learn how to love each other. And I get, I get kickbacks every once in a while. But I wish I had somebody to tell me that when I was younger. But anyway, that's just, that's just in relationships. When we're following God, we, there, there should, there's no plan B. It's just kind of, we just cut that out. There's no plan B. And that's a lesson that we learn from Elisha. It's a, les a lesson of commitment. A lesson of commitment that we see from, from Elisha. And, um, and it's a commitment of all or nothing. In Luke 14, 26, if we got that up, that would be great. And this is what it says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And this is, Jesus was saying this about the disciples who follow him. But let me explain. Jesus is not saying that he wants us to hate people, obviously. He's not saying, I want you to hate your mom and your dad and your brothers and sisters and things like that. What he's saying is, when we follow him, it, it, in contrast, it's like, it's like everything is just you, Lord. Everything is just you. And in contrast, it would seem like, it would, it would appear like all these other things, all these important things in my life, that they're a distant, not even a second, but they're just, they're, they're here. And I'm just going to serve you, Lord. That's it. And so that's what the Lord is asking us, to have that kind of commitment, to put Him first. And we, we cha we're, we're challenged with that because it's kind of hard and we're, you know, we love our family and it's like, I'm not going like, to hate anybody. And God is not saying to hate anybody. He's just saying in contrast to the love that we have for Him, that it would appear in that, in that, in that sense. 
but that's just the kind of commitment that um, that we have for God. But let me let me tell you something about commitment. When it comes to the commitment and um, the commitment that we have for God, it is actually birthed out of the commitment that God has for us. Because our commitment is gonna we're gonna fall short. I mean, we, we do we get married, we make all these promises, and we promise to love each other and all these kind of things. And we, we, we fall short sometimes. Our commitments fall short. Our love for each other falls short. And, we, and there's, there's, a, there's a shortcoming on our side. But there's never a shortcoming on His side. And God is committed to every single one of you. So committed that He has given His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. That you may have life. That we can all have life. Have life eternal. Life everlasting. And that's His commitment to you. And so when it comes to commitment, yeah, we say, oh yeah, Lord, I'm going to do all these things, and we try our best, but we're, we're, we're going to fail. But let's take a look at, at the kind of commitment that, that God has. And I'm just going to read this, and I know we could all quote it, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But this is the part that we, we, usually, we usually stop reading the scripture at that point, but let's continue on. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and His name is Jesus. So when we look at this, we see a picture of, of God and His commitment towards us. His commitment is unwavering. There's no, there's no, there's no kinks in his in his armor. This is completely committed. God is chasing every single one of you down, chasing you down with provisions, chasing you down with blessings, chasing you down with love and with grace and with mercy. He pursues you. He is committed to you completely, and that's something that we want to be able to remember. So when we see this lesson from Elisha to be committed to God and to be committed to His call, that's great. But above that is the commitment that God has for each and every one of us. And that is unwavering. There is no getting around it. God is absolutely committed to you. Would you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Praise God. He, it's, it's just amazing. And so uh, we're going to move on. So in 2 Kings um, uh, 1, 9 through 15, uh, we're going to take a look at, and we're going we're gonna to do a little contrasting with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, then the king sent a, um, to him a captain of 50 and, the, and his 50 men. Okay, so what happens now is um, Ahab's son, he's now the king, and he falls through this um, lattice panel, and he gets hurt. And he sends his, his, um, his, uh, his prophets to go ask of Baal. He hey, go ask of Baal of Ekron to tell me if I'm going to be okay. And Elijah catches wind of this, and he says, go back and tell the king. That if you're gonna look for for Baal and you're gonna look for Baal, then that, that you just what you're saying is that there's no God in Israel, and because of that, you're gonna die, right? And so it's kind of rough. And so the, the messengers go back to um, to the king and say, "Oh, there's this guy, and he stopped us, and he said that you're gonna die because you're looking for the prophets of Baal. You're not looking for the one true God." And um, the king finds out that it's Elijah. And so now what he does is he sends these men out to go fetch Elijah. Okay? So the first group of men, there's one captain and 50, and 50 um, guards. And so they go out and they go to Elijah. And they say, Elijah, we want you to come with us. The king wants to see you, O man of God. And Elijah says, if I am a man of God, let fire rain down from heaven. And as soon as he said that, but bam, fire comes from heaven and it just consumes these 51 people. The one captain and the 50 soldiers. So fire comes down. Boom! And they all die. They get disintegrated. And so he's sitting there, and then the king sends, sends another group of 50. So another, another captain walks up, and he says, Elijah, man of God, the king says to come with us. And Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let there be fire from heaven. And so again, boom, bam! Fire falls upon them. Fire of God. The Bible says it's the fire of God. So this fire falls upon them, and they die. They're just completely dead. And so now there's a third wave that comes to Elijah. And this third wave comes to Elijah, and he says, Elijah, like, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, and have mercy on all of us, and like, hold our lives as valuable. And so, Eli and so an angel says to Elijah, don't, don't, don't dose these guys either. And uh, so what happens is Elijah follows the, the messengers to the king, and everything's okay. The, Elijah delivers the message, and, um, and, and, and Elijah's absolutely fine. 
But what we see is we see that this prophet is exercising in the Old Testament this form of judgment, this form of fire from God. He's calling fire from God. It's like a fiery boom. And, and there's just this judgment, this scene of, uh, of God judging people. And um, we want to contrast this with the New Testament because later on, uh, when Jesus is, is on earth, his disciples ask Jesus, hey, do, do you want us to call fire down this like Elijah did and kill all these Samaritans because these guys are like bad guys? And we're going to take a look at, at this and we're going to see a wonderful, wonderful picture of grace. Okay? So in Luke 9, uh, 54 through 56, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And you see when Jesus says in, to save them in um, John 3.16, and when we see it in John 3.17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What this is, is, is showing us is that things were done in the Old Testament in a different way. The fire of God was dropping on people and pounding people and killing people. That was the, that's an old, that's the old way of God doing things. But in the New Testament, this is the time when we live, Jesus said, that that's not why I've come. That's not who we are. That's not the spirit that we're following. We're not pounding people with fire from God anymore. So Jesus rebukes his own disciples. He said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. This is a major, major contrast in, in the Word of God, and we want to be able to understand this. Because a lot of people think that the Old Testament and the New Testament just run it together. You know, after all, there's only like one page that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. And it's absolutely, there's a, there's a change, there's a difference. After Jesus Christ dies and He's risen again, there is change. How things used to be done are different from how things are being done now. That's why when we drink the, the, the juice or the blood or the wine, what it's representing is that we are in this new time. We are in this covenant of grace. God gives to us things that we don't even deserve. We don't deserve all the wonderful things that we have, all of His goodness, all of His kindness, all of His blessings. We don't really deserve any of it. In fact, we do not deserve any of it. But because of His goodness and because of His righteousness, he gives it to us. And all we have to do is receive it. So we see in this passage of Scripture, we see this wonderful um, opportunity to look at this contrast of how things used to be. Because a lot of us still, sometimes still think that if I do bad, the fire of God is going to come down on me. And maybe not like a fire from God, but like something's going to happen. My, my, my car um, tire is going to pop when I'm driving on the road with all my kids. And God's going to judge me. And then, then I'm going to get hurt. And then I'm surfing and something happens. And like, oh, that was God because he's <laughs> judging me. And sometimes we think like that. And it's absolutely wrong. That's not who God is. That's not what God does. That's not how he, he does things. That's an old way of thinking. And so we need to understand that we live in a time of grace. We live in a time of grace where God's unmerited favor is upon each and every one of us. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. All right. And so, uh, it's, uh, and, and so we're going we're gonna to move on to um, uh, 2 Kings uh, 2, 3. Okay? And so what's going on now is Elijah is about ready to get translated. Okay, so many of you may or may not know that Elijah never does die. And again, this is a wonderful picture of God's mercy because Elijah made some major mistakes. He did some wonderful miracles, but he made some major mistakes. But even with the mistakes that, that he made, God, he, he never did die. Okay, Elijah and Enoch in the, in the Bible are two people who did not, who did not die. They, they got translated. God just took them up. They got, they got like raptured. Okay? And so... On, on Elijah's way to get to being raptured, this is what happened. Some of the other prophets in the other, in the other villages, um, and in fact, I'm just going to tell you. So Elijah and Elisha are going are to go to this place where Elijah is going to get taken by God. God is going to come in this whirlwind and you know, fire, and it's going to pick him up, and he's going he's gonna to take him to, to heaven. To, he, just, he's going to be just translated. He's going to be gone, okay? And for some reason... All the prophets in that area knew that it was going to happen. And it's found in, in verse 3. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, 
do you know that the Lord will take your master from you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. And then in, in, um, in verse 5, it says, Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take your master from you today? And so he answered, Yes, I know. So keep silent. And here, here's, um, here's something that we want to take a look at. How did these prophets know that God was going to take Elijah? How did they know? And, and here's, here's, here's the answer. It's because they were in tune to God's voice. And God is speak, God was just speaking. And, and when you're just, it's just like that radio station. God is talking to every single one of us. He always is. He, in fact, He's always, always, always talking to you. The question is, sometimes if we have our dials dialed in right, because if, if we listen to the radio and it's like 92.5, right? Or, or hopefully we listen to 102.5. Nine. Okay. So anyway, if, if, we're, if we're listening to, to those to those radio stations, it, it's clear that the, the the sound comes in clear. But if it's 102.9, then we change it to 102.8, 102.7, 102.1. All of a sudden, now there's static, and, and we and we cannot hear we cannot hear clearly the the radio station. We cannot hear clearly the frequency. And likewise, God is speaking to each and every one of us. He has a message that He's speaking into your heart. He's trying to awaken you in some place. He's trying to tell you, like, stop playing and talking over there. Or He's trying to say um, something like that. I was just joking with you guys. But seriously, <laughs> stop playing and talking over there. <laughs> but anyway, God, God is always speaking to us. And, and God was speaking to these prophets too. The only difference is that they were tuned in to God. And it's a symbol for us, it's a, it's a lesson for us to learn that if we're all tuned in to God, we would all see the landscape of what God is trying to speak to us as even the church. You know, when we're doing our life journals and we're reading through the Word of God together, if, if you notice, there's, there's almost like a theme. You, you sit down and you read the Word and you start to journal. And then you're driving your car and you're listening to the radio and it's kind of like, hey, that's kind of something I, I just read about in my journal. And then maybe one or two days later, then you'll be talking to a friend and they'll say something and say, hey, I just heard that when I was reading my Bible. I just heard the Lord say that. And all of a sudden, you just see like there's like a message. There's kind of like a, like a theme that God is speaking to you. And you hear sermons, and you say, hey, that's just like the sermon that so-and-so gave. I wonder if they're all in cahoots, and just kind of like, this is what we're all talking about. And they're not. It's just everybody's just being in tune with the Holy Spirit. And so many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, many of you, I know, are, are continuing to learn what it's like to hear from the Lord. And the Lord is always, 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 always speaking to us. All we need to do is listen and have our radio dials dialed in just right so we can hear what the Lord is saying. And so what we learn from that is that there's a, a need for intimacy and that God wants to speak to every single one of us. Okay? In 2 Kings 2.11, then it happened. As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. That's amazing. Okay, that is just amazing. So Elijah and Elisha are just talking. They know something's going to happen. And this whirlwind just, just comes and these chariots of fire takes Elijah and it takes him off. And, and we don't, um, it's not the subject today to talk about um, if Elijah went straight from there to the, to the Mount of um, Transfiguration where he met with Jesus and with Moses. And so there's um, a lot of different things, but that's just not the subject that we're talking about today. But here Elijah is, he gets taken. He gets taken. He gets what we would call today, he gets raptured up. And this is a, is a wonderful picture and a wonderful reminder for all of us to know as well. Did you know that God could come for, for us at any given time already? God could come in at, the, at just the twinkling of an eye. We could all just be taken up. For those of us who have declared Jesus Christ to be our Lord and our Savior and our King, at any given moment, the Bible says like a thief in the night, he'll just come and he'll take us up and everybody will just, everything will just disappear. Those who belong to Jesus will just be gone. Okay? And this is exactly what happened to, to Elijah. And again, all the pictures of mercy and of grace, who God is, we get a chance to see that. And even though we have shortcomings, and even though we drop the ball, and even though we sin and we've done 
We've done things wrong because of who God is and because of God the Father seeing us through the lens of Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees us as righteous and he sees us as his own. When it's time, we will just get caught up. How many of you believe that this is going to happen in our lifetime? <coughs> I believe it as well. I believe that it will um, indeed happen in our lifetime. And um, in case some of you are wondering, like, what, is it, what does it mean? Like, what, is, what do you mean like a rapture? Like, what would it look like? We, we have a, a video that we want to show, and some of you may have seen it before. Um, and it's just a video that kind of showcases what it could look like um, when, when indeed the Lord does come for, for us. So if we could get the lights, and uh, let's take a look at this, uh, take a look at this video, and then uh, we'll be on the... says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 42, watch therefore for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know church that Jesus Christ could come this month or he might come next week or he could even come... There's kind of like a little, little scare like, like when everybody gets uh, uh, raptured up. But for those of you who may not have it, it's just an idea of what it could look like um, when the Lord does come um, for us. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of teaching that we could get into as far as eschatology, with, which um, is a study of end times. And we're going to do some of that next year. And uh, take a look at a, at a worldview of like even there are some New Agers who know that something is going to happen. And uh, they've already um, came up with this plan that what's going to happen when all these people uh, disappear from the face of the earth. It's really interesting things, and um, uh, we want to be able to take a look at, at what's going on and, um, and understand the times. God does tell us that He wants us to understand the times. And this time, church, we live in a time of grace. Grace, that, that's really the, the word that we just want to always just be um, impressing upon our hearts. The grace of God, the unmerited favor of God that's upon our lives. How much He loves us and how much He has already done for us. And it's really, you know, it's found in His kindness. The Bible tells us that it's His kindness, it's His goodness that draws us to repentance. That means that we don't get scared like, oh my gosh, I want to make sure. I mean, we don't want to be a part of the rapture where the Lord comes for us. But it's not birthed out of fear. We, we, we don't want to scare anybody and say, like, oh, you sinners, and you're so bad, you need to change your life. And we, we, we want to change our life because of how good God is. Because He wants us to live a life. Just like us loving our children. We love our children. We want the very best for them because we, we love them. We don't want to give them licking and say, like, why aren't you going to listen to me? And you know, just kind of all this stuff. It's, it's not birthed out of, out of, out of, out of anger. It's birthed out of grace. It's birthed out of God's mercy, His love for each and every one of us. And that's what we, you know, when you come to church, we just always want you to leave church knowing how much God loves you. And when you receive God's grace, 
He will change our lives. He, it's kind of like when we trust in Him and we do things His way, we receive His blessings because we're doing it His way. His kingdom, His style, everything is done His way. But what we do a lot of times is we do it like our way. Instead, I'll do some of it your way, I'll do some of it my way. And when we hang on to those things, it just it eats us alive. We want to just, we have one last video. I hope you don't mind. We, we want to take advantage of our, of, our, um, of our media and the ability to kind of show videos and things like this. And... Um, this is just a, a video of God's grace and what it does in our lives and to remember that this is the time that we are living in now, a time of grace. Was blind.